Hello, my name is Roxy Marosa and a hearty warm welcome to Butu with Roxy Marosa. Today's episode, we're talking about poverty. It's not your usual kind of conversation. I'd like us to look at what is poverty in our country. South Africa is seen as one of the most unequal countries in the world. We have a very huge gap between the rich and the poor. About over 30 million of South Africans are living in poverty. 55.5% of our population. What are the reasons for poverty? And is it possible that perhaps the way that we think might actually be the cause of poverty? With us, we have Professor Eleluani Ramugondo, who is going to help us explore this subject and look at what can we bring in to actually alleviate poverty. Please help me welcome Professor Ramugondo. Oh, I am so honored. I just have to tell you, Professor Ramugond and I are friends, but we've never really had an academic conversation. <laughs> so when I heard that she was actually coming on as a guest, I was like, really? And I was given the notes and I thought to myself, I don't know any of this. So I said to the ladies, <laughs> next time when I go to her house, I want to see a billboard that has an introduction to say, this is who I am, so that I know that I'm entering holy ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eleloan, if I may address yes. you as that. Certainly. You have an incredible resume. You're a professor at UCT and you're an occupational therapist. You've done tremendous work um, in rural communities as a clinician in the US. Can you please just tell us, because usually when people think about occupational therapy, we think about physical impairment. But in your experience, poverty in this regard, you're actually using it as a cause for disability as well. How do you actually explain that? So I think I will start with a disclaimer, right? So as a professor at a university like uh, UCT, often as academics, we tend to want to define people's experiences when we haven't actually lived uh, the experience. So often definitions of poverty have uh, not had much input from people who live poverty every day. Yes. But I want to say that um, my childhood has not been uniform. Mm -hmm. There has been times when I experienced what is referred to as poverty. Yes. During the early 80s, my family found um, themselves uh, in a rural part of South Africa during <laughs> drought. Yeah. Drought that affected everybody, mm -hmm. right? I remember living on pup and cabbage every day. And it tasted good. <laughs> For a while. Yeah. <laughs> After a few days, you realize that life can't be this, yes. certainly, yes. right? Yes. So when, when, when we, we talk about poverty, um, we need to think about it in terms of individuals, but also as whole populations. Mm -hmm. So for that time, that period, everybody was feeling the pinch. Yes. Right? I could say it's about three to five years that I felt that my family was poor. Before that and after that, I never thought we were poor. Yeah. Even though our income was more or less the same. <laughs> so it begins to tell you that perhaps to reduce poverty to income yes. is a misconception. Poverty is not only about income. Mm -hmm. Poverty can also be about relationships. Yeah. It can be about the richness that communities have in terms of stories and traditions being stripped away. Yeah. It can also be about lack of access to land as a means of production. Mm -hmm. So can you see how <coughs> one can feel poor suddenly because they've been told they're poor <laughs> when yeah. it is not actually 
their everyday experience as they understand it. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, this, this, this understanding of poverty that is tied to only income is limiting. Yes. So that's, that's where I will start. But this is not to say that income doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At a certain level, it begins to matter when we live in a capitalist society. Of course. Where everything costs money. Yes. But people can have income that is above that uh, poverty line and still feel poor, right? So one could say that it can be a mental state. Money matters, but only up to a point. Absolutely. When you have no access to means that allow you to reach your aspirations, to live a meaningful and dignified life. Mm -hmm. That's when we in occupational therapy and some of us begin to talk about disabling conditions. Impairment, when you have privilege in terms of income, does not necessarily lead to disability. Of course. So I'll use the example of poor eyesight. If you have poor eyesight, but you have appropriate and timely access to care and appropriate spectacles, you won't even think of yourself as disabled, right? Exactly. But someone who has poor eyesight, let's say as a child, in a, uh, an area where, and, and, and coming from a family where access to an optometrist wouldn't be likely, that child's future is already hampered neg negatively, right? Mm -hmm. So just that inability to ac access what a person needs in order to reach their aspiration is already a disabling factor. The concept that I like talking about is debility yes. rather than disability, right? Mm -hmm. Not that disability doesn't have a, a role to play in society, because it is important to acknowledge when people have an impairment that could lead to disability, yeah. right? But understanding that an impairment that does not necessarily need to lead to disability. Yes. The limitation with the concept of disability is that it's so focused on a diagnosis. Yes. So you must first have a diagnosis in order to receive care. Yes. Right? So, but if you don't have an impairment, but you live with disabling conditions, <laughs> when are you going to get the care? that you need. What if a whole community is constrained in having individuals reach their aspirations? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that we would never look at them? But debility as a concept doesn't depend on the presence of a diagnosis. Yes. It looks at, well, is this community with resources mm -hmm. that are basic yeah. for everyone? to have opportunities. Yes. And when these opportunities are available within a community, but the individual themselves is unable to see them as a resource, that one you can start saying, mm, you better look at yourself. Yes. And begin to acknowledge things that are around you that you can tap in, in order to make a success of your life. I really love what you just said, and I wish we had more time to unpack more of that. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we welcome Tenju M. Gedisi, who heads up the Rainbow Academy, and she's going to tell us how they help the youth to tap into their talent and to contribute to the economy. Welcome back. We're now joined by Mam T, known also as Tenjue Mgedisi, who heads up the Rainbow Academy. The Rainbow Academy is a nonprofit organization where they help the youth to tap into their natural talents, which will help them to contribute to this economy. Welcome, Mam T. Thank you. Can you just tell us what is the Rainbow Academy and what do you do? Our Rainbow Academy is a performing arts school. It's where we train our youth 
then we drive them to their career path. Mm -hmm. As like before we started the Rainbow Academy, me and the director we were the student at UCT. Yes. Then we were having some problems at UCT, mm -hmm. knowing that when you just go at UCT, not having the foundation before, then we were struggling in our departments. I was in the African music department. Yes. She was in the jazz department. All right. Then after she thought of like, okay, can I help the, the youth in our townships which are not having like money to go to school, yes. to university, to pursue their career? Then it's when she thought of starting the Rainbow Academy in 2010. Mm -hmm. Then by then, we ended up going to the townships and looking for the student who cannot afford the university, but they do have the talents. Yes. Music, dance, and the drama. Mm -hmm. Then we've taken those students, like knowing that they must finish their education. Yes. But our side, we're also looking as like, they must have the metric mm -hmm. before we take them because we are looking the exit. After they finish with us, then we train them, we give them the training, the intensive training, because it's a one year course that we're doing, but it's a three year diploma All at right. UCT. Yes. And then after they finish with us, we look the schools for them, we look the universities that they can take them, and we look the scholarships for them so that when they get at university, they can have the scholarship. When they come to us, we know that, okay, maybe you don't have what other students have. Yes. But you must make sure that do not look the next door. Mm -hmm. You just do your own thing. Do what you're here for. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you're going to use what you've got from us. Brings back the notion of poverty can, is actually a mindset. No, it's a mindset, dear. So there, there is no poverty, really, Prof? <laughs> Look, uh, my um, understanding of what Mom T has said is that because of Rainbow, uh, the Rainbow Academy, young people are able to get somewhere. Yes. Mm. When we talk about a critical success factor, we're talking about that kind of example. Yes. If Rainbow Academy wasn't there, these young people would still be locked in mm -hmm. the poverty cycle. When young people have no options, and we have communities that have no options, Yes. Because there is not even the likelihood that the Rainbow Academy could be started there. Mm -hmm. What do we say about such young people? Yes. Because it's not enough for them to pull themselves by the straps of their boots with no foothold. Absolutely. So what Mom T is offering <laughs> is exactly that which I'm referring to as the critical success factor. Mm -hmm. It's in place. It's giving these young people a foothold. We ask the student before we, 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 we ca carry on with their course, mm -hmm. do you want to pursue your studies? You want to go further with your studies or you want to start your own business? Yes. It's when the business is coming in mm -hmm. because we're also helping them to manage themselves yes. because we know that like a, the artist, each and everyone is always saying that the artists are poor. Yes. You cannot manage yourself. Yes. You need someone else to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's when we said, okay, why can't we, we are the business people? Yes. Because an, a, as an artist, you are a business. It's what we are putting the business and the performing arts. You do the art, then you go by yourself, you do the job for yourself. Mm -hmm. you, no one is gonna manage you, you must be able to manage yourself. Yes. When they finish with us, some of them, they are working mm -hmm. because of getting that course with us. They are also able to teach because we teach them to know how to teach, to refer the skill to other people mm -hmm. because we referred our skills to them. To them. So once you have such possibilities in 
those communities, then you can talk about individual drive to make use of those opportunities. Exactly. This is really such an interesting topic. But when we come back, we're going to meet Sergio Smith, who's going to tell us about his experience at the Rainbow Academy, what he has done and where he's at right now. I believe South African youth lead the way. Show me only those kinds of love that will make me aware of my place all the time. The vision of the Academy is that we become an institution that is sustainable and that we impact hundreds and hundreds of youth and that the Academy becomes a beacon of education, of social transformation for youth who are talented in the arts. To me, um, dancing is a language that you speak with your body. Um, it expresses things that you can't say, but things that you feel with me. Yeah, so the piece we did today was based around youth, and about Youth Day that we're celebrating on June 16th. Take whatever you have and just run with it. Doors will open for you. If you've just joined us, we're talking about poverty. And now we're going to talk to Sergio Smith, who's been a student at the Rainbow Academy. He was a student in 2017, and he's now working. Welcome, Sergio. Hi, thanks for having me on the show, Roxy. Now, just tell us, you started with the Rainbow Academy in 2016? 2017. In 2017, 2017. and graduated you graduated in the year. same year. Yeah. Tell us about your experience. My experience at the Rainbow Academy has been probably one of the toughest journeys that I went through like because for me it was trying to reach the experience of the people already working in the industry so yes. everybody that is already in the scene that are professional I have to play a game of catch up in a certain way mm -hmm. so if I'm going to be going through Rainbow Academy that's a year of me learning before I have to do so it was quite like challenging because you're not working. So the main problem was like probably having funding to do this, what you're so passionate about. Because yeah. it's your dream to like follow whatever you pursue. But if there's no funding towards it, it doesn't mean that you're poor or anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. Yes. So for me, the main thing that I focused on was getting one thing done at a time. So simplicity rather using logic mm -hmm. so if you can get one thing done today you wouldn't have to worry about that same thing tomorrow going to rainbow all i saw was like classes but these classes all generated it wasn't like the same type of classes that you get at school where you have to study and you need to learn it and then regurgitate it onto a page yes it's more in work experience so when you learn something this would be used actually so when we did business we learned how to do a SWOT analysis to weigh our strength and weaknesses and opportunities mm -hmm. and all of those things, it plays a hand in hand in a certain type of way. So one year is strenuous to become professional in yeah. one year. It's not an easy thing to do, but if you work at it, eventually you can reach your goals. You're now a professional dancer yeah. and you're working. Yeah. Tell us about that. It's not the life you expect, it's all glamour and all of that, but it's a lot of hard work. With all the glamour and with all the airtime that you do get seen and all the, you know, the glorification of it, mm. you have to put in the work to like show, no, this is why I am here. Yes. This is why I can stand before you and show this product. So that's basically what it is. But as far as professionality goes, it ties hand in hand of one, I was at Rainbow because we did hospitality and business. So with hospitality, it comes of a way of etiquette, you mm -hmm. know, like, so how do you conduct yourself? How do you conduct yourself during like um, shoots and all of that? So there are people around you. One important thing that I want to leave is communication. That is the most very important thing because you can have nothing, but if you can speak, you have everything. Because you can start with like, 
any com sort of communication is a connection. Yes. And through that connection you made, people will remember you, remember you through that. So first impressions do last as well. But at the same time, it's how you carry yourself in the order. The energy that you bring will be the same energy that you will get back. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I like what you're saying about energy and communication and the fact that when people have a voice, you can actually use that. So really love that. Do you have any questions? Once you found your golden economy, then how did you, what are some of the steps that you took to um, start it and negotiate not being seen or heard or, or like having no access? Yeah. Uh, okay, the Renba Academy is, uh, that was started in 20, 2010, right? Then uh, the idea that was more like a project before so that we can be known by the other people. Then it's when we change, then we must do the academic, not like a project of like a, taking the youth from the township and just do the performing. Then we've, we've got that drive of, okay, they can learn something and then can, they can graduate after that. They can have the certificate so that they can work after they finish with us. Now, across South Africa communities lack what we call the critical success factor mm -hmm. that Professor was talking about. Now, in such societies, how do we even begin to encourage young people to realize this golden economy um, in them? Because some people don't even know what their talent is if you actually ask them. Mm -hmm. So how do we encourage that spirit of searching for your golden economy within you? I can actually answer that. Honestly, sometimes it's not that straightforward. Like, you can never encourage someone else because it would kind of be like, how can I say, like forcing their mind into something that they may be all talented in it, but at the same time, you can't force someone to have that belief in themselves. Like, that belief only comes through self love, honestly. Like, through that self love, you will be able to drive yourself to do whatever it is that you want to. You know, so motivating individuals works at an individual level, mm -hmm. right? But when communities as a whole are trapped in a cycle of poverty, I mean, what we saw with Marikana yes. was a situation where there was a ceiling for generations. Yes. So your parents are mine workers, you will be a mine worker, mm -hmm. or you might not even have a job. Yeah. In certain uh, farming communities in the Western Cape for years, people were not even given an income, but were given alcohol, mm. which meant that they had children that are born with um, fetal mm. alcohol syndrome. Yes. And, and you, when you have a community in such a situation, you can't leave it to individuals mm. to fight it out on their own. It becomes unfair and it becomes victim blaming. Mm -hmm. And this is where the work of the rest of us in society must advocate. We must advocate for communities such as that to get the basic resources. That's all from us today and thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of the studio audience and a special thank you to my guests. Until next time. Now please remember to find us on Facebook and leave your comments on there. Thank you.